Hello, good day, and I'm Andresito de Guzman, your host, along with where's with Michael Land. Say hi, Michael. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming. Great. So I guess let's uh, begin. But first, we're going to introduce our organization first. Okay, so we are PWA Pilipinas. Um, yeah, if you do have questions, um, please visit bit.ly forward slash Fugu Ask. Okay, great. <clears throat> Next is, okay. So, PWA Pilipinas is the community organization for progressive web app enthusiasts, designers, and developers here in the Philippines. Our mission is to introduce and nurture progressive web apps development and adoption in the Philippines and beyond by fostering a community for subject matter experts, enthusiasts, adopters, and developers of the platform, and by providing resources and engagement to stimulate interest in the technology. Because our vision is that for the Philippines to have a better user experience because of progressive web apps. Um, yeah, we do have an app. We do have a progressive web app. Visit app.pwpilipinas.org for events and other other things about our organization we do have that and we do have facebook twitter and linkedin just do search for us there or you may send us an email okay first a quick introduction about progressive web apps so what are pwas they're your traditional web apps but added with native apps functionality there are your pwas uh, basically your pwas are web apps with progressive enhancements and they do have some of these features like being able to work offline, being installable, being engaging, and typically they're smaller than most native apps and shareable through URLs because they're web apps. Okay, so some examples here in the Philippines that I'm proud to, to share to you. We do have the official Department of Tourism travel app that you can check out. That's app.philippines.travel. We also have one from 7-Eleven Philippines, Click Grocery. Just visit clickgrocery.com for that. Um, also, we have Starbucks Rewards. So it's also a progressive web app. If you want to do check that out. And we also have our own. So PWA Filipinas app. We do have a PWA that you can check out if you want to experience progressive web apps for yourselves. So, yeah. Um, here's our calendar for December. Okay. So, I am. we are very pleased to actually have here today um, our speaker so um, I'll be introducing him to you Where's that? okay kind of lost it. so our speaker is uh, Kenneth Christensen he is a Danish software engineer and architect specializing in mobile and web technology he's working at Intel out of Copenhagen um, he helps uh, define Intel's strategy and plans regarding the web platform as well as put it in action. And before, ni uh, before joining Intel, um, Kenneth was employed by Nokia where he worked on the Nokia N9 web browser, QT, uh, Q sorry, uh, WebKit, as well as many other mobile projects. And he's also an elected member of the W3C Technical Architect Group currently working on making progressive web apps more capable as part of Project Fugu. So, let's welcome on stage, Kenneth Christensen. So, Hi, uh, and good afternoon, and uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining me today. So, uh, I guess we should just uh, get started and learn uh, more about like where the web is heading. Uh, sure. So, let's uh, share my slides. Uh, let's just go full screen, and you can tell me when you can see it. Yes, we can just see loading it. a bit. So yeah, let's get started. Um, it's a bit early morning for me, so I'm drinking a bit of coffee while presenting. I hope that's totally okay for you. So first of all, like my name is Kenneth, uh, and I'm going to present you today. So I work at a company called Intel. It's a semiconductor. Uh, so you might be wondering, like, why is a semiconductor working on the web? Well, the web is basically everywhere today. Uh, so you probably know about Chrome and Edge browsers, JavaScript and the like. Uh, so as uh, Andre mentioned, like uh, I'm actually in the W3C Technical Architecture Group overseeing the future of the web. 
and making sure that all these efforts going on are kind of aligned uh, so that we end up with a good result for developers and users. So why does Intel care about the web? Well, uh, our friends at Microsoft has been saying that more than 60% of time spent on like Windows on a PC is actually inside the web browser. And it's actually more than that because a lot of those usages uh, for like what people consider native apps, like using something like Spotify, uh, using uh, say like Visual Studio Code and other apps are actually built using web technology as well, using something called Electron. And the reason why people is using Electron is because sometimes they need a bit more features than what the web can provide today. So it's really important for us to keep on expanding the web so that you don't need to use something like Electron. You can just use a progressive web app. So that is one of the things that we want to talk about today. So the web is really great, or I believe the web is really great because it has this great reach. Uh, like you can run the web basically everywhere. Like I, like my my uh, apps on my TV, smart TV, are also based on web technology. Uh, you have web browsers on most devices. And there's a very little friction because everything just starts with a URL. But what is also great about the web is that it's safe. Like you can visit a lot of different websites without one being like afraid of it, like installing viruses on your PC. Uh, it's also ephemeral. So if you visit all these websites, you'll probably not visit them all again. So it's not like installing an app and suddenly you're out of storage because if you don't visit the website, like frequently, like the resource from that website will just get removed over time. There's a lot of other advantages like it's linkable, so you can link straight into a specific experience. Like say I found a tweet about this talk today. I can send that over like instant messaging to my mom. She can click on it and see that tweet immediately. She doesn't have to install an app. Or maybe even if she were to install an app, maybe then just the app will pop up and she will have to find that tweet herself. Uh, so there's all kinds of, the, uh, of great things about the web. It's also composable, uh, com so you can take a, a new site and actually em embed web content there from a different site, like a tweet. Uh, for instance, if you're talking about politics, it's nice to see what certain politicians have been tweeting. Uh, it's also indexable, so you have like search engines like Google, Bing, etc. But as I said, the web starts by the URL. Uh, it's, everything is just URL way. And like this is... You're working about progressive web apps, but I normally say that if you've been to any conference in the last couple of years, you've certainly heard about progressive web apps. So these experiences that can work offline or with intermittent network connectivity, uh, that, that can be performant. Of course, you can write a progressive web app that's not performant. Uh, and like also responsive. So if you click on things, you don't have to wait seconds for it to respond. So the web pl platform is a pretty nice place to be. As I said, there's worldwide reach. It works across all major architectures, OSs, and form factors. There's also a thriving open source ecosystem around it with like JavaScript libraries and the like. It's flexible for all kinds of different experiences, such as for applications like progressive web apps, but even for books, news, and games. And you can write web apps that are really performant. And what a lot of people don't know is that it actually has a really comprehensive set of APIs. So there's a lot of things you can do on the web, even today. So a short like recap of progressive web apps. Um, here I'm looking at an old screenshot of my Chromebook and you see I'm going to this website called Pinterest. You notice that up in the, uh, in the address bar, it says install uh, because this is a progressive web app. Uh, it has a service worker, so it works offline and it has a manifest file, a web app manifest that explains kind of like metadata for this application. Uh, if I click on it, I can actually install it. And just by clicking on a button, suddenly I have this application. This that looks really native. Like actually I couldn't distinguish it from any native app. And as with service worker, you can make it work offline. So it's pretty great. But sometimes uh, you might not be able to create that experience you want using the current web technologies. Um, like maybe there's one API that is really core to your experience uh, that is just not available on the web today. It could be that you're writing something like a app that really requires NFC, uh, but you don't have access to NFC on the web. So 
that is why a lot of people then go and use like Cordova or or like a Electron. But it might also be that you have a fear that in the future um, you might be lacking one of your APIs. So say that um, your competitor is writing the same app but using native technology. So your competitor gets access to all the newest APIs as they get uh, released on Android and, and iOS. But they might not be released on the web for years. Uh, so that might be a fear that maybe all your users will move to your competitor, competitor because of this. And the web kind of really lacks this like roadmap showing like where it's heading. So all of this can build some kind of distrust in the web platform. So this is just an example. Let's say that next year, let's say like Google is launching the Magic API. So this drives, everyone wants to use this Magic API. Let's say it's something like machine learning on the web uh, and, and like everyone just wants this. So, but like you embed it on all your, your product, you embed it on the progressive web app, but you don't know like when this is ever coming to the web. And well, maybe in some sense you could emulate some of it, but maybe it's just not good enough and maybe the performance is not there. So what are your other options? Should you go native then? A lot of people believe that native is always better than the web, but that is actually not the case. Because like I said, initially the web has very little friction. It loads quickly and requires no install. This is also because the web engine itself comes with a lot of features built in. You don't need to distribute that with your apps. Um, it's also like composable. So like with a native app, it's very difficult for you to say if you've installed Twitter and you have installed a news app, uh, then it's really difficult to embed that native app feed inside your, nat your like other native app, unless you're embedding web technology. Uh, so like also with deep linkability, uh, like that requires of course an install at first and not all apps actually support this. Apart from that, the web is really good at accessibility. So also with native, it's of course like a totally different skill set, uh, but it's not just one skill set. It's a different skill set per platform. So if you want to write like a native app for Android, you cannot just recompile that for iOS. You have to start basically from scratch. And then you cannot, if you want to do like a native Windows app or other kind of native app, it will be the same. Also, a lot of these uh, systems are designed for specific uh, devices, like um, say Android devices kind of have like a specific form factor. So though you, today you can run uh, Android apps on, on Chrome OS, they really don't feel like desktop uh, quality apps. Uh, like because like desktop apps are normally something you use with a keyboard and mouse. So a drop down menu, you really want it to just be like regular desktop like drop down menu and not like take over the whole screen like it will do on an Android device. So this of course can become all quite costly. So there are a few workarounds uh, like you could use Cordova or Capacitor, but it's not really a best of both worlds thing uh, because like you lose things like deep linkability. Of course you gain friction by requiring an install upfront and they're like also native dependency per platform. So if you want to extend these with a plugin, say to Cordova, well, that plugin will have to be written for each platform. You can of course also embed web, but you cannot be embedded yourself. But can we actually fix this? And how can we regain this trust in the web? Uh, so this is my overview of what I think is blocking people from adopting web technology. Uh, this is what I've heard from talking to developers over the years. Sometimes you have existing code uh, that is written maybe a long time ago, and you don't really have the time to rewrite everything, say in JavaScript. It might be something like, uh, like Autodesk. They have this application called AutoCAD, and they actually have it running on the web today, but they started like 35 years ago. So the code base is like 35 years old, and it will take considerable amount of time uh, to write, rewrite all of that in JavaScript. So they went ahead and just used WebAssembly. So we have things today on the web like WebAssembly, SIMD, Threads, and soon WebGPU that is, will allow you to repurpose existing code and bring that to the web. Sometimes it's bad performance on target devices, especially when you do this like native-like experiences, you really want the behavior to feel native as well. You want scrolling to be super smooth. 
So there's a lot of good things happening here as well. Of course, we have libraries. Like we have had web workers for a long time, not so easy to work with, but we have gotten libraries like Comlink and Platform Worker that makes this much easier. There's also the whole like CSS effort called Houdini, where we're trying to like expose some of the inner working of CSS and allowing people to write libraries that actually, when you need like specific uh, use cases, uh, you can actually implement that in JavaScript and then like reuse that again and again. So say like you want to do some really fancy animation, you can use CSS Paint or Animation Work Lab. We're also getting something called Subtree Visibility, basically a way to tell that, please don't re-render, like render all of my DOM because it's not visible yet, uh, but only do it when I, when I need it to be visible. Uh, so all of these things together can result in much better performance uh, for web apps. Another big issue that a lot of people is, is talking about is that when you do native, it's kind of like easy in, in the sense that um, you look at the tutorial, the tutorial says, well, you're writing an Android app, so you're going to use these components, and this is how you do. On the web, it's a different story because it's kind of like, yeah, okay, you're doing the web, but we don't come with a component set. Or like, well, there's some HTML elements, but they don't look that great. Um, and like, uh, you kind of need a framework, so which framework to choose from? But this is being uh, improved a lot later, uh, lately. Uh, especially, I think web components is doing great. Uh, it has taken a long while, but they're finally here. Personally, I use lit element and lit HTML a lot, and I'm really happy with it because super tiny, only a tiny part on top of what's on the web platform, and the results is great. So you're also getting like uh, good toolkits, uh, like Microsoft is releasing fast uh, for kind of their assets. Uh, Google has the material web components uh, based on material design. And Ionic uh, has this kind of like more neutral system that works both with, uh, with iOS kind of design and with material design. Um, but like all kinds of companies are creating their own design system using web components and using it across all the different assets. But let's talk about the last thing, what we're actually here to talk about today, capabilities. So we talked about AutoCAD before. So they have this working in the web browser. This is basically a, a website that can read these AutoCAD files, like the 2D version that accounts for like 90% of all assets out there. They would like to support 3D. We're soon getting web GPU. So I think that will happen soon or be happening in, in the future at least. Uh, so you see they have one part of it is kind of the view. Uh, this is done by using a canvas and WebGL and WebAssembly. And the rest uh, is basically just Web UI. I believe they're using React at this point. But like a lot of people that use like an application like AutoCAD, uh, they often have big local files. And they might not necessarily want these files to be up in the cloud or to be in an Autodesk cloud system. Maybe they're all keen on using a OneDrive by Microsoft or something else or a, a local thing. Because like a lot of these people using these applications for, might even work for the government. I know my dad is, is using AutoCAD for, for like drawing roads for the government. And like they have like special requirements that this should only be in a specific cloud system or, or like on their local hard drives. But accessing local files has been a pain on the web because you normally upload these files somewhere modify them and have to download them again. So this would be one of those lacking capabilities. So this is why we're introducing the product Fugu. So product Fugu was created by Google um, and then later joined by Intel and Microsoft. Um, so Fugu or Hugu, I believe is pronounced, is actually Japanese for the puffer fish or the blowfish. Um, so this is a very cute fish, but it's not always that cute. <laughs> But in Japan, people actually tend to eat this. So yeah, okay, people eat fish, but this fish actually is poisonous. So if you don't know how to cut it correctly, you might actually end up dying because it have a nerve toxin inside it. So it's kind of like delicious uh, if prepared correctly. And if not, it might actually be deadly. So this is kind of like what we used to describe product Fugu because native capabilities are dangerous. As we said, like the web is supposed to be safe. So we need to explain users what they are doing. And we need to be very careful when exposing these two web applications because we might break the web. So this is why if we get it done right, it's going to be delicious. 
But if not, huh, it might be deadly for the web. That's kind of why the name was chosen. <laughs> so what we're really trying with Project Fugu is that exposing the same capabilities of native platforms to the web platform, but while maintaining user security, privacy and trust, and other core tenets of the web. So here's a URL where you can read like the original introduction to Project Fugu. And you can also always go to the Chromium bug tracker uh, and search for Project Fugu, and then you'll find out what everyone is working on. But what I really suggest you to do is going to the uh, Fugu API tracker, because that's really, really nice. And it kind of like shows you what we've already been shipping. You can see that with the Fugu logo. Uh, so if you look at WebShare target API, that is already shipping. If it's green, it means it's currently in an origin trial. And we'll go back to what that is. Uh, so it's like a really good overview of what it, we've already accomplished, as well as what we're working on. So let's talk a bit about the process. One of the problems on the web has been that it traditionally takes a long time to get things standardized because a standard lasts forever. So if it's in a browser, you need to maintain it maybe for the next 20, 30 years. So you better get it right when it's landing. Um, so all of this means is like different browser vendors and everyone has to discuss and make sure that this is done in the right way. So that basically takes time. So how are we improving this? Well, with Product Fugu, we try to identify need and use cases. And often someone like a partner, like a company that is gonna use this feature when it's released. Then we write an explainer. So explainer is this kind of like document that explains you the use cases, why we're doing this, why if people tried to do this before, why they failed, uh, like some of the solution we've been considering and maybe abandoning because of a lot of reasons. And this is kind of like the starting point. Um, then we normally put this to the tag to get an early review to, to make sure that the idea is sound. Then we iterate, start working on the spec, maybe writing some implementation, prototyping. Some early developers will adopt it by turning on a flag. When it's kind of like a bit more stable, we create this origin trial to get like actual developer feedback from actual deployments. And eventually we should end up shipping it. Origin trial is this uh, nice feature that allows uh, a feature to be turned on for a specific site without any actually being shipping in the browser. So it's kind of this interesting thing that it's implemented browser, but it's not shipped by default. But you go into this website and you say like, well, for my website, I would like to use this feature. But I understand that this feature might change in the future. It might also never ship. So I need to make sure that my website works without the feature enabled. Um, because also if like, because like this allows me to, to test it in the wild, let's say I'm Facebook. So there might be an, a new like camera API I want to use. So I might turn this on for a certain set of users by using the origin trial. Uh, but also if like Facebook said like, nah, we'll just turn it on for everyone. Uh, that might be really bad uh, because then later maybe like they don't want to make changes to implementation and Google or, or Apple is like kind of like, so supposed to support it in this like way, this API shape that maybe isn't the perfect one. So even an origin trial has this thing that's an upper limit. So if you get like, say like more than, I don't know what the, the, the exact amount is, it can change, but let's say it's over 200,000 users, maybe to just turn it off. Um, but what is also important is that as this is an ongoing, this is happening during development, it might be that from one Chrome release to another, there are actually changes. So that is why you have to go and reapply for an origin trial. So the way it works is basically you get a key, like a token. You can add this in your request headers, uh, or you can just add this as a meta tag on your website. Very simple, very great idea. So this is just an overview of how to, the site looks. So let's now uh, look a bit about like, what are we actually working on uh, in Fugo? Or what have we been working on? So one of the part is uh, hardware connectivity. There was this survey from MDN, uh, and it actually showed that a lot of developers say that they really want hardware connectivity. Uh, that is a really important part of what is missing on the web. So actually before Project Fugu, uh, the Chrome team started working on exposing Bluetooth and USB uh, to the web. 
So this has actually happened, and just like a very nice example of uh, a web app that actually controls a Lego uh, Batmobile. Uh, so it's just like one of the examples of what you can do using these technologies. I have an earlier talk uh, that goes into deep details about USB and Bluetooth uh, on the web. So I encourage you, I want to share these slides with you all after this talk. And I really encourage you to check that out uh, if you have interest and time. So this is already shipping, uh, but people are like, we're not standing still. And people are still working on adding a few additions to make sure that this follows the standards and, and that people can really uh, use this for their use cases. Another thing very close to shipping is Serial API. So Serial API is actually an old kind of API. You probably know from your like mouses and keyboard, um, mice and keyboard. Um, but today people usually use Serial on top of existing APIs like USB. Um, so you could say, why don't people just use Web USB if you're gonna use like Serial? Well, the thing is that a lot of OSs like Windows and, and say like Chrome OS, uh, they already understand serial, so if you connect the serial device, the OS itself will try to handle it. And thus you don't get access from, say, web USB because the device is claimed. So this is allowing people to just use serial directly. And it's also a much simpler API. You don't need to use to know all these details about USB. So great. Uh, and this is uh, very close to shipping in Chrome. Similar is HID. This is, um, I believe it stands for human... Uh, interface uh, devices. So this is like a keyboard and a, and a mouse. So if you plug like a keyboard into your OS, the OS will take care of the keyboard uh, and you don't want to expose that to a specific website. It will use work with all apps on your computer. But, uh, but HID is kind of simple. So a, a lot of people have used this. It works across, it works on top of like Bluetooth as well. So Bluetooth and USB normally. So a lot of people have used this for implementing things like a barcode scanner, uh, uh, or like even like gaming contr controllers. So we also really want to expose this uh, to the web so the developers can target these devices as well. So as I said, this is currently in an audience trial and also very close to shipping. Something we've been working on at Intel is NFC. Uh, so NFC is actually a huge collection of different standards and we need to start somewhere. Some of it is really low level. Uh, which means it's really hard to expose in generic way to the web. So what we have decided is to start with the globally supported and, and simple uh, standard called NDEF, which stands for NFC Data Exchange Format. So today we have an implementation that works great for reading and writing NDEF records to say NDEF tags for other devices that can emulate tags. And it's very complete and you can learn more at web.dev slash NFC. Um, it's something we've been working on for a while on and off. And I remember in Japan, I showed this to the inventor of the web, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and even he was excited. So I kind of love this picture. Um, this is a small demo. I'll see if I can play it back, uh, if I can find my mouse here. And it kind of like shows you a game where like it will show you on the screen. So, so what it kind of showed you is that you can, it will show you the order on the screen and you have to tap it. So this is like another demo I made. I made this grocery list. So the idea is you have this nice grocery list. You can add things you need to buy. But I thought like, yeah, this is, this is kind of nice. I'm just like showing you how it works. It's a very nice progressive web app using the material uh, components. So I can add like olive oil and you see it, it, it's on my gross, uh, grocery list. But I can also click on this thing called write to NFC tag instead. So say that I am often running out of uh, toilet paper. So I could place like a sticker next to where I store all my toilet paper. So when I run out of it, I will just like touch that tag instead and it'll auto add it to my list. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. Uh, so I, I wrote uh, NFC stickers, NFC tags to it. And you see that just by tapping it, it's, re -add it's adding these things automatically. So you could imagine having that like uh, maybe some stickers on your uh, refrigerator. So it's just like an example of what you can do with something like uh, NDEF support. Very simple API, uh, there's an unreading event. Uh, and whenever you get a reading, 
and it's actually like an I don't like an MG tag or it has like records on it. Uh, well, then you can read those out. So here I'm reading some some JSON and I'm even reading out like a binary data and and showing that up as an image on the website. Very simple. This is an origin trial, and we're very close to shipping this as well. Uh, it's basically done. Something else we worked on at Intel is generic sensors. Uh, generic means that we had a lot of sensor support on the web, like this geolocation, there was something called device motion and device orientation, but they had all kinds of, or they have all kinds of issues. Like for instance, like you might not need 60 frames per, per or like events per second, uh, which will drain your battery. So if you only need 10, why can't you configure it? It's also very high level, so it, they don't allow you, uh, they introduce like interoperability issue, they don't allow you to do uh, like like your own like sensor fusion. And also for sensor fusion, there's like no reading timestamps. So there's all kinds of issue. Also like the implementation were implemented like differently across browsers. So sometimes you need to know, oh, I'm on iOS, so I need to like modify the values a bit so it works the way I want because it works differently on say Android. So we call it generic sensors because it's kind of like, like a sensor framework. So you have this sensor base class, and then you have like accelerometers and linear acceleration sensors derived from accelerometers, gyroscope, or orientation sensor and the like. So I have also written a very detailed uh, presentation about sensors. So if you have any interest in sensors and how to work and how it exposes the web, I encourage you to check that out as well. Simple example, um, also because the API is so simple, it's it's kind of possible to emulate it. So here just emulated, uh, I, had, I made this application use the sensor framework on my phone, and then I emulated it using uh, an IoT device. And I actually used like web Bluetooth uh, just to like uh, connect to it. I know that you see a USB cable that is just for charging. So uh, as this is only supported on Chromium-based browsers like Edge and Chrome, um, I have written some polyfills so you can make this work on iOS as well. And it will make sure that you get the exact same readings. Uh, so if you have any interest, check that out. What's also really important on the web, web is very social. Uh, you probably know that. So it's very important about sharing content and and receiving content or receiving shares on the web. So we've been working on web share. So web share is basically a simple API that allows you to share some kind of content to other apps, uh, which could be normally like native apps, but of course, like it could also be progressive, like progressive web apps that have been installed. Very simple API. You just share title, text URL. And I believe today you can also share files as well, but I haven't actually tried that. Receiving shares requires you to be a progressive web app and have it installed, and you need to extend the web app manifest a bit and, of course, handle it. So this is actually shipped today, so you can actually do this today. But people at Microsoft is working on improving this support on Windows. Getting back to the whole AutoCAD thing, like reading and writing to files is very important. This is also one of the core reasons why Visual Studio Code is an Electron app because like you want to deal with your repositories, uh, repositories on your local hard drive. So file system access, earlier known as native file system, is the API that allows this. And this is actually shipping today, not on Android though, but on desktop systems. Very nice, very modern API uh, that you can use. Very cool, but we're still working on improving it a bit to cover all the use cases that people have. Uh, apparently, I'm missing some slides here, but we have also been working on meter session that allows you to, to for instance, get this like share sheet, uh, like this sheet, like if you're playing back a music uh, or a video, you can actually interact with, with that, uh, or even like using your multimedia keys that you have on your keyboard. At Intel, we've been working on, on also media streams as well, making sure that we have like excellent camera support. So you can apply your own filters, do, uh, pan and tilt and zoom on, on cameras that support it. So you can actually do like really crazy and cool stuff like something like this uh, funny hats demo I'm showing here. 
So here's an example of uh, my coworker Rijo. You see him on the right. He's actually using a camera with supports like Zoom and Tin and Pant. So this is very common for especially like conference video. So if you want to do something like say Zoom or Hangout uh, or Google Meet today, uh, it could actually support something like this. So maybe like using a machine learning to find out where someone is sitting and talking and zoom in on that person. Uh, so this is actually shipping and we actually uh, shipping Zoom, Pan and Tilt as well. We've also been working on future things. A lot of cameras in the future will probably have depth sensing uh, capabilities. So actually a different sensor that can sense how far away things are. Uh, so you see here that allows uh, you to, to actually like really make really nice, like change the background really nicely instead of using machine learning that awfully, often have issues maybe where you, with your hair and the like. Uh, so really powerful. And here's a other coworker that actually showed you how precise this is. So he's actually interacting with things in like this scene, just using a depth sensing camera. And I actually find this like super amazing. Like see, he can actually pick up this box and place on top of another box. So I, I think like this is like amazing what you can do when you get precise sensors. So it's not so common today, but I expect this would be something that we'll see more and more in the future. So this is not shipping, it's uh, behind a flag. So if you have one of these cameras that support this feature, you can actually play around with it, with it already today. Something else very important on the web, a lot of companies say is very important is, especially if you're in, in in the business of sending packages or like having a to maintain a stock, uh, well, then detecting barcodes is pretty nice. But actually, it's kind of like you can detect more than just barcodes. And often there's like special hardware or special like very optimized software on devices that will do this. So this is really important both because it's fast and also it uses less battery. So Shape Detection API is the API that does exactly that. Uh, it, it actually has, uh, it's actually standardized to work with uh, barcodes of all kinds, um, face detections, as well as text detection. But we're currently only shipping it for actually barcodes. Very simple API. Give it an image and it will detect if there's a barcode there. If you have a video, well, then you need to feed it all the frames. It will also give you back some information about where the barcode is so you can draw on top of that image to really show like, oh, this is where I detected the barcode. Uh, so this has shipped, the barcode support is already shipping today. Another part of Fugu is system integration. So this is like more touching on the progressive web parts of it. So we're having batching like, oh, you have an unread email, unread like uh, instant message, uh, uh, so like you can like kind of do these bar dispatch patches. So some you can even do it just like, yeah, there's something unread or you can even set a number. The system might support showing numbers like Windows does that, but for instance, Android doesn't because it's not part of the UI design of Android. So it kind of depends. Sometimes even if you set a number, if it's not supported, well, then it's just going to show a dot instead. But this is also ship uh, and works on, on Windows and Android and Chrome OS, I believe. Um, something else I've worked on is uh, the annoyance of having the screen turn off while you're doing something like you're baking a cake, your fingers are all dirty and you're following this recipe, but now you get this screen or like you get a dark phone or laptop and you now you need to wash your hands and touch it a bit. And after a few seconds, it turns off again. This is actually pretty bad because uh, it's even pretty bad for battery life because what do you don't what you probably haven't thought about is what people do is that they go into settings and turn off sleep, like never turn off the screen. And, and then they forget to turn it on again. So battery life is already always pretty bad because it never sleeps. So the screen is always on. So there's actually already some cases today where the system will not turn off the screen. So if you're playing back a video, so people have done all kinds of crazy workarounds that are even worse for battery like playing a one pixel video uh, on the website just so it doesn't turn off the screen. So we thought like, why not just like create a, a API for this called wake lock. So actually there's two kinds of wake locks. There's a screen and system. System is like, you can turn off the screen, but please don't sleep. But what we're shipping currently is the screen wake lock. 
So it basically just allows you to keep the screen on without like wasting battery as much or without people having to go into settings. Very simple API, request the wake lock, and after a while, then you can release it. There's also all kinds of other things built in. So if you change the tab, unfocus the app, if you turn off the screen yourself, like the, the wake lock is just gonna be released. So this is basically only if you let the device stay there and with the screen on, like then it's gonna like stay alive. But of course we wanna like avoid abuses. So this is shipping today. Something else we heard a lot uh, is that a lot of countries really uh, want to like have access to contacts because it's a lot like based on social. Uh, so maybe you you want like like to send an email to someone you have your contact in SMS or or you want to bootstrap a social network. Um, but contacts are like kind of like privacy sensitive, so it's really about like making sure that the user knows what is happening at all times. So the way it works is we have this contact picker. It will show you exactly what is uh, what can what will be shared with the website. It won't allow you to select all of the contacts. It will have to select them individually. And you can even say like, now, well, I don't want to share the phone number. I'm only going to share like email. Uh, you are in control. The way it works is that you will tell, first of all, like what you want, like do what name, email, telephone, maybe one, just one contact and maybe one multiply. And then you ask for that. So for instance, if someone like chose me, they'll get some JSON back here, like an array of JSON where they have my email, my, my name, but not my telephone number. So this is shipping as well, uh, shipping on, on mobile phones. Uh, and, uh, but we're working on some additions as well. Something else that's really interesting and kind of dangerous is font access. It's kind of dangerous in the sense that it's, you can very easily uniquely identify someone from the fonts that installed on the system. Uh, so this is not something you want to expose to all website on the web. It's really only for those apps that really need it. And like those apps do exist, especially like something like Figma where you're trying to design like app UI, like it's really important that you get the right fonts. Same thing like for, for say like a presentation, like I might have a special Intel font on my laptop that it's not accessible online, it's not accessible in, in Google Slides, but maybe uh, I can access that uh, if I allow it. So this is also something we're working on. Something I've been working on, or I am working on personally at this point is uh, support for an upcoming uh, set of devices. Uh, some devices are fo called with foldable screens and some devices that emulate that using two screens. So they kind of have one virtual screen. Uh, so this is kind of a new set of emerging devices that are ultra portable, flexible, and allow for new kind of multitasking scenarios. So a foldable device is a device where the screen is actually foldable physically. Uh, it might not be as good at, with like touch events exactly where the fold is. Um, and other devices like a dual screen is one that's based on two screens. So we have been working on different APIs for this. Uh, something like better support for the for virtual keyboard because it might just be on one of the screens, support for knowing the fold or the, the posture the device is in, um, and a, a ways that you can span the app across these screens and avoid having like a dialogue in the middle. So for instance, if you look at this example, my coworker wrote, Alexis, uh, you see it's very nice if I put it in the screen, uh, in the middle, this is on a dual screen device, you see like the image kind of get cut. It's not the nice experience you want, especially for these like zoomed in images. This doesn't look that nice. So spanning uh, is, is the solution to that. Uh, so this is like how it's supposed to work. So if you use this uh, support, which is supported from JavaScript and CSS, you can change the experience to become something like this. Uh, I have a, another example of the video, another video here, because we actually wrote this small like polyfill for this and a small widget, uh, like a, a small like web component you can drop into your web page if you want to play around with this. So you see now I'm emulating uh, this feature, and it even have some uh, uh, pre-configured devices, uh, like known devices that actually are like foldable and dual screen devices. So really nice uh, example 
that really allows people to use this already today. Um, here's another example of a battleship game. So you can really see this, so you can create all kinds of new experiences using these devices. Very exciting. So uh, some of this is shipping in Edge behind the flag uh, uh, today, and we're working on uh, on integrating all of these kind of experiences, even like support for multi-screen devices. Uh, so we have like one coherent solution. Microsoft has been working on uh, what they call uh, customization of the title bar. So you see a lot of like native app today. They like you see like Visual Studio Code. This is an Electron app, but so it's semi-native. Uh, they allow like the title bar to actually have all the menu items. And you see teams that have like this search thing in the title bar, the same with Spotify. So we would like Progressive Web App to have the same ability, but if you give Progressive Web full control of the title bar, they can emulate like a browser and they can do like phishing attempts. So it's a really difficult, so we have to find a solution where that is not possible. Um, also really um, very, very difficult to do because we really don't want uh, people to get fished. Um, so if you look before uh, the uh, product Fugu, uh, you had all these kind of APIs. Like I said, the web already had all kinds of APIs available. Uh, but with Fugu, you're already getting all these new kinds of APIs. So really filling the gaps. Uh, there's still a few gaps, but we're still working on it. And the web is going to be pretty awesome. If you have something that you believe is really missing on the web so that for you to actually adopt web technology, please go and file a request. So you can go to bit.ly slash new Fugu request and actually file an issue in the Chromium bug tracker. Uh, so um, some of the resources, go to the API tracker, make sure uh, to, to have an overview of what's going on, get that roadmap of what is coming to the web also to see if that thing that you need is already being worked on or not. Um, you can also go to the Capabilities landing page to learn a bit more info about Project Fugu, uh, but really join the effort. Like there, the Fugu sync meeting, like reach out to me on Twitter if you're interested. Um, in the W3C, if you're a member of W3C, like some of this work is going on in CSS working group, like, like things like especially the dual screen thing. It's also happening in the second screen and device and sensors working group. Um, so like pitch in and uh, with that I want to say thank you uh, for listening and uh, I'll stay on and uh, I'm ready for like a lot of you know, nice and good questions but also feel free to follow me on Twitter and reach out to me on Twitter and with that said uh, yeah I hope you enjoyed this talk and now I can finally get some coffee <laughs> Okay, so um, thank you for that really wonderful talk. Um, we do have some questions here from our registrants and our okay, viewers. Okay, nice. So, yeah, um, let's uh, let's have this first one. So, um, were you able to try eat to eat fugu, and how was the experience like if you were able to? Yeah, I, I have actually <laughs> tried eating fugu. I think like three times. Uh, so the first time it was like fried, so it was just good fish. Uh, I guess like maybe the frying uh, like hit the taste a bit. Uh, then later on, I actually ate uh, like the raw pieces of fugu. It was pretty okay. Like people said it's like extraordinary great experience. Like, well, it was good, but I had expected something maybe better. And the last time it was a very fancy restaurant uh, where actually apparently like, what is this thing that? Well, that's a bit of fugu brain as well. So, okay, yeah. It was just, it was okay. It was good, uh, but maybe not that out of this world experience that I've, I had like expected. But then I'm also hearing that the people that are really, really into this, like there are people who can cut it so precise they actually get a little bit of poison uh, so that you can actually like feel it on your tongue. But yeah, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm gonna try that. <laughs> actually the first time I didn't even know I was eating fugu until people told me. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, let's have another one. So how do we explain progressive web apps well to common people? Uh, that is a really good question. Like, 
in, in a sense, uh, it's a misnomer in the sense that it's basically just the modern web today. So it's kind of the same when we had like HTML5. So HTML5 became this thing that felt like, oh, that is the modern web. So going to like a program manager or companies and say, you got to adopt HTML5. And we're like, yeah, 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 that's, that's the new thing. But HTML5 was not referring to the HTML5 spec. It actually also, like in people's mind, it included like queue location, a different spec. CSS free, totally different set of specs. It included like the whole modern web. And that is kind of like the same with progressive web apps today. The name is great because it allows like me to go to internal management and whatever. It's like, you should do progressive web app. This is the thing. It's a thing that they can understand. If I just say, it's the web. Well, we've had the web for like 30 years. What is the difference? They need like a brand to understand that this is something new. Um, I think like even today, like progressive web app, people are considering uh, like some people say like, well, it's web app manifest and it's like service workers. And, and, and maybe it's, it's also like push notifications. Uh, but hey, like people, when you talk about progressive web apps, they, it's about like the whole new experience that you can get like also smooth experience, like even like web assembly, the CSS features, uh, and of course, like the Fugu capabilities, the, the progressive web app part of it is basically just like turning it into something that's installable. Um, so like that is the best name we have. It works pretty well. So it's all about like, this is the modern web experience. Of course, Progressive Web App is about the, the ability to install it and have it work and act native. But for actually to work as a native app, you need like, of course, the capabilities, sort of product Fugu, uh, that's maybe not the best name. Um, and of course you need like, like the other things coming to the web, like maybe web components, you don't need to rely on a huge framework that makes it slow so that you get these experiences that are installable, uh, works great with intermediate network, but also performant. And, 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 and responsive, like when you click on things, things should happen immediately. And when you scroll, it shouldn't like flash around, it should look like smooth and, and, and nice. So if you looked on Twitter, like I think Alex Russell, uh, a friend of mine from Google, uh, he showed like some tweets where he's adopting like some of the sub tree visibility. It's like, it has different names, like uh, um, that kind of allows you to like, to like hide some of the DOM or like not render that until the last minute. And he applied that to his blog. So if you go to his blog and actually like try to scroll on a mobile device, it's like super smooth. And it's actually just like loading all that content. So you see there's all kinds of things going on the web to bring the web to become like really competitive with nature. Um, I don't know if that is a non-answer, but progressive web app is, is about its ability, but it's much more than that. Uh, it's more like a movement, I'll say, you can say. <laughs> okay, here's another one. So since you've been getting feedbacks, um, what's the most loved or used web capability API? Uh, I don't, I, I don't know what exactly, like, I haven't looked at the stats, but I would believe something like native and I like the file system access is something that a lot of companies want. But, but the thing is to understand, it's not always about what everyone wants. Sometimes like this, like specific API that, that, that is only maybe for like, say like 2% of the web, but it's so core to the experience. So like something like web Bluetooth, like this is not something you want every website on the web to adopt because like, no, why should they? But I have seen like a friend of mine worked at a, at a point in a company that did like resuscitation dolls, like these CPI dolls for training, like resuscitation. And like they could connect to them either via web USB, uh, the new devices or the old device web, web uh, Bluetooth. And like, that was great because like all they needed like in the hospital was just to install the latest Chrome browser. And before they had, oh, now I need to write a native app. Oh, what are you using Mac? Or uh, no, we're using Windows, like old version of Windows. So they had to have like all kinds of like native applications. Then they need like permission access from administrators. So see that like, this is really solving a, an actual use case for these companies. And that's just like one, like I've heard a lot of use cases, like with IOT, like a lot of like the Arduino ports and like, they're like, you just like plug in to the computer. I thought even like, like was it Lego or like in the new Roomba, they made this system where you can like program this like mini Roomba, I can draw one thing. And just like, you just like talk to it using web Bluetooth or web USB. And you have an IDE on your, or like a drag and drop uh, thing to program it on your, say, Chrome OS device or Windows device. 
So it's really solving actual use cases and expanding the use of the web, but it's not something for every website out there. So I think that is really important to keep in mind. This is for the breadth, this is for the long tail, and it's gonna be really different for, for one side, one app experience to another, what kind of APIs they're using, which is actually the same for native app today. Uh, but it's often something I hear, like people have this idea about the web, it needs to be a feature that every website is gonna adopt. And that is not the, the case here. This is about the long tail. Okay. So, um, yeah, with that, can I share something? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> here's something I did, like it's a train tracker app. And yeah, I mean, can I say thank you? Because I really needed the web block, <laughs> the, the wake lock API. So actually this is a train tracker that you can like track your ride. Yeah. So. Yeah, like before, my problem was that every like every like fifteen seconds or thirty seconds, the screen turns off and like the GPS disconnects. And yeah, I, um, upon integrating that wake clock, I can, I can. It's usable now. Yeah, like people yeah. can track their rides without having the screen turn I, off every like. <laughs> I am yeah. very happy to hear that, and it's actually very interesting with the wake clock API because. We had a lot of people like saying like, no, why do we want that? Oh, that's going to be bad for battery. We should just not do it. But it turns out there's so many users for this. Like so many people really wanted this. And and like we could enable it by default without a permission prompt because people were using workarounds. Like I said, bad workarounds like playing a video in the background. It was like really draining battery life. So like, like it's really great. And even like for Intel, like I could tell management that it was a great thing because like we were working hard on making sure that our laptops and whatnot actually have all day battery life. <laughs> and one of the optimizations is like, let's turn off the screen and like dim the screen when people are not really using it. Because like, if they're going for a coffee break, uh, why should we be using like, like hundred percent like screen power for that? So when people actually, when they figured out that, when I figured out that people actually go in and actually turn off like it globally and never turn it on again that was really bad so so being able to say that to people well this will make sure that people don't need to do that uh, so more people will have better battery life on the devices uh, and i think that's just really great uh, and i think we made a lot of like i said like we added a lot of we thought a lot about this and then all these cases where you lose the wake lock so if you have your app running but you forget about it and you start doing something else you're probably not using it any longer drop the wake lock. Uh, if I go back to focus your app, well, then you can request it again. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so we do have one question from our YouTube viewer. Okay. So, device-related APRs are cool, but you have to completely reimagine what you could build for the web. And few folks would build a whole new app for an origin trial. Um, what would you probably do to help with that? Yeah, that is actually uh, something I, I didn't mention. Like I said, like origin trial in, in some can, uh, senses, we try to tell people like, well, you make sure that your web app works without the origin trial uh, because you're trying deployment. But it's definitely the case that sometimes like you could just not build that experience without that origin trial. Um, but I think in that case, we don't have the risk. So that the, uh, so much, well, you don't have the risk that like you, you get a big company as Facebook to adopt the feature like we did with the, the prefixed version in CSS before, so that we just had to support it. Uh, this with this feature, like like, uh, well, you're using something that's not shipped yet, so this is like early prototyping phase. You can use join and trial. You can get actual developers to use it, uh, users to use it, and get feedback. Uh, so I think the audit trial actually works really well for that. Uh, but of course, like you cannot bet your business on this until you've come to the point where it's actually shipping. Uh, so of course, I, I guess the, so far, it's very important that the things that we actually turn into origin trials, we actually intend on shipping uh, because, and, and kind of intend on shipping them uh, when the origin trial kind of ends and we fix the feedback from the origin trial instead of like maybe two years after. Because otherwise, why would people uh, start doing the prototyping and maybe start a new company uh, on this feature if it ends up not shipping. That would be kind of bad. And, and that would mean that people will not bet on the web in the future if that happens. Uh, 
so that's something definitely something we need to take uh, take in my uh, into uh, like have in our mind when we're working and, and enabling origin trials uh, because it is otherwise you get the distrust in the web that we try to avoid uh, so things that should become an origin trial it should be something that we actually intend on shipping uh, pretty much uh, soon after the origin trial ends and we have had the time to implement the feedback i hope that answered it answers it Okay, so uh, we're down to our last question. So um, the question is, how can developers like us contribute to Project Fugu? Many ways, basically. <laughs> like, like voice your, even like on Twitter, like voice your, like what you want. But like, like I showed in the presentation, you can start by uh, checking the Fugu tracker to see if people are working on what you care about. They like try to, to talk to the people and say that this is awesome. If there's an already trial, sign up for it and give good feedback but like you can also go to the chromium uh, like the link i showed to actually file a request for chromium for a feature uh, at least that way it will get uh, triaged and and looked over by the people from the chrome team uh, working on uh, project fugu uh, but even like in the w3c we have this thing called the ycg is the web incubator community group so everyone can join and and like just look that up there's a whole process that you can even, like propose a feature, but that kind of like more requires you to do a bit of work yourself. It's, it's not just like, hey, please implement this feature now, now. Now you actually need to do some of the work yourself and maybe come up with an API design and, and find the actual use cases and the like. So it kind of depends on what kind of commitment and interest you have. Uh, but also like feel free to reach out to me on Twitter and, and we can talk and I can see if I can guide you in the right direction. Okay, so I guess that's it for our, our session tonight. So thank you to our speaker, Sir Kenneth. So um, if you do have other questions, you can directly ask um, Sir Kenneth on Twitter, probably. So yeah, um, any other like any other words like um, last words to like um, close this program? Like, got anything to share? Uh, me, uh, no, like, like, yeah, well, always bet, bet on the web. I think the web is doing great. Uh, I think we're seeing a lot of adoption on, on progressive web app. Initially, it was all on, on mobile. Uh, but I think now we're seeing on desktop, like, like people, the, I think the thing is that people develop apps now mostly for mobile devices. And, and then like, but this device are really nice for a lot of use cases, a lot like doing business, you have this big screen and have a mouse and keyboard, it's very productive. Um, but as companies only have limited resources, they cannot build like all these kind of native apps. So adopting web technology, especially on desktop and supporting Windows and Chrome OS and, 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 and Mac OS and maybe iPad, uh, like that really helps a lot. Uh, so, so I think the future of, especially on apps on desktop is progressive web apps. Uh, it's still not the future on mobile. It's more like an option. Uh, so, like, like web technology is is doing great, uh, and keep betting on it. And uh, we'll do our best to make sure that you succeed. Okay. So, um, thank you, Sir Kenneth, again. So, before we end our program, so okay, um, if you ever wanted to have a replay or your friends wanted to watch this session they can watch it on demand it'll be uploaded on youtube and also on our pwa pilipinas app just visit app.pwapilipinas.org so yeah and of course um uh, december 20 2020 we still have from dev summit <laughs> tomorrow so uh, if you want to learn more about progressive web apps um just visit developer.com.com chrome.com forward slash uh, dev summit so it happens 1 30 later so yeah make sure to catch it so with that um thank you for watching our event today project fugu reaching parity with native um i'm anisito de guzman together with michael lance of pwa pilipinas so bye bye take care have a nice day